Well, thanks for that. Uh, that was really good. Believe it or not, that was one sentence in the original. Right? The two longest sentences in the entire Bible were in Ephesians chapter 1. That's the first one. <laughs> I thought I was going to be able to do this verse by verse, but I thought, hang on, that's all one sentence. That's all one thought. Not one breath. Not one breath. <laughs> So we're going to uh, sort of push on through here. Um, <coughs> I'll just remind you of where Ephesus is. Okay, so this is the Mediterranean. Judea is down here. Cyprus, modern day Lebanon and Syria here. Cilicia, that's Tarsus, where Paul was raised and born. This whole area here is modern Turkey. Greece, and here is Ephesus, which is the gateway to Asia province, all the way in here through to China. Everything comes through the port of Ephesus. Okay? It is the end of the Silk Road at that stage. All right? And from there they go, the ships go through there, through the Corinth Canal, and across to Rome, over here, all right, and all points around the place. So, get an idea of where Ephesus is, the second largest city in the empire, and it is the number one port, industrial and commercial hub of the Eastern Empire. So, that's where it is. Now, uh, There. I'd just like to start by showing you some wonderful words from one of the great hymns of the church. You might remember that as we were going through those songs this morning, they're all about blessing, uh, blessing him and so forth. And here we've got this one. Praise God from whom all best blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. How many of you know this one? Yeah? Praise him above you, heavenly host. Praise Father, Son and Holy Ghost. That's pretty much what today's message is all about. All right? So, just going to go back a couple. In Ephesians 1, 3 to 14, we encounter some of the most incredible truths in all of Scripture. So much so that many think that there's no section of Scripture with a greater concentration of truth than those written in this passage that Thoma just read for us. Right? It is the most compact, densely packed sentence of gospel truth in the entire Bible. And although a cursory reading might suggest that these verses are a kind of a theological maze, <laughs> they are in fact very purposely laid out by divine inspiration which brings together the whole trinity. Uh, Ephesians 1, 3 to 6 describes the will of the Father. Ephesians 1, 7 to 12 describes the work of the Son. And Ephesians 1, 13 to 14 describes the witness of the Spirit. So fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> right, we're in for a good morning. Well, we all like blessings, don't we? There isn't a person in the room that doesn't enjoy a blessing, obviously. And certainly we are a blessed people. This is God's own country, isn't it? The promised land. And when it comes to this matter of blessings, we often view them in the wrong light. <coughs> Most often we think of blessings as being those things that are physical and material in nature. For, for instance, if everyone in our household is well, we consider ourselves blessed. If there's money in the bank and the bills are, pay, are paid, we say we're blessed. If we're living in a nice home and driving a good car, we equate that with blessing. And I would have to agree that all those things are blessings for the Lord, from the Lord. However, what happens when a loved one is stricken with a dread disease? Did we cease to be blessed? No. What happens when we drive junk cars and our house is falling apart? Did we lose the blessing of God? 
What happens when there's no money and we can't pay the bills? Does that mean somehow the Lord has stopped blessing us? The answer is no. Okay, Because our problem is that we tend to look at blessings in regard to how they benefit us materially. And certainly God does bless that way. What we fail to remember is that these kind of blessings are temporary at best. Some of us a bit more temporary than others. Uh, that, day, that, that car will die one day. That money will find a place to be spent. That home will deteriorate and fall down one day. And your health will one day eventually decline. What we need to know is that the real blessings of the Lord are not material or physical. The real blessings of God are spiritual in nature and these spiritual blessings will never be taken away from us. Even when everything else is gone, has broken down or has been spent, we still possess the best of God's blessings. And there are three little thoughts in the last part of that verse that teach us the valuable lesson of how to recognise God's best blessing. And I'd like to point those out to you today. So verse 3 reads, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Yes. Now, by way of introduction, notice how the verse begins. It begins with a note of praise for the Lord. Blessed be the God and Father. Right? So it's just one sentence and it begins like that. Blessed be the God and Father. He tells us that the Heavenly Father has blessed us. I want you to note that the grammar in the original Greek is very important. In English it's all about spelling and where each grammar, you know, verb, noun, subject and so forth is in the sentence. In Greek word order doesn't matter. You can have it in any order you like. That's how they recognise different Greek authors because they all have a particular way they, put, they write in the Greek. Right? The grammar in this Greek text is very important. Grammar is everything in Greek. It tells us that has blessed us is equivalent to the English past tense. At some point in the past, God blessed us. Not only that, but those words are also in what is called the active voice. This means that those blessings that we received at some point in the past continue today and will continue on into the future. In other words, I have been blessed, I am being blessed, and I will be blessed. That's all summed up in those words. It may not feel like it and all the facts may be stacked against it being true, but it's true nonetheless. Some of you might know Phil Hannaford. He used to have a saying that he used to quote from the pulpit regularly. You know, the facts are, but the truth is. The facts are, yeah, my house is falling down, my car's a heap of rubbish. <laughs> but the truth is, I'm blessed. I'm saved. Right? Well, if I have those great blessings, I want you to know more about them, don't you? And thankfully this verse and those that follow it in this chapter give us all the information we see. Let's notice these truths that we discover how to recognise God's best blessing. Well, the quantity of those blessings. Let's go back to verse 3. Where did I put it? That's there. The quantity of these spiritual blessings can be summed up in one little word found in verse 3. Every. Thank you, David. What was that? Every. Every. It's the word every. I looked up that word in the Greek and I discovered something fascinating. Every means every. <laughs> right? There's no subtleties, there's no shades of meaning. Right? It means the totality 
of any object, mass, collective, or extension. Right? It means everything. Without that, there's nothing left. All right? So, every. So he's given us every blessing. There is no secret blessing. There's no hidden blessing. We have every blessing. All blessings, every blessings. We have each blessing. We have the whole blessing. All right? You with me? Every, the totality. God held nothing back from his children. When he saved us, he gave us everything we needed to serve him. And we have everything we need right now to be content, to be successful, to be obedient, to be useful to the kingdom, and to be happy in Jesus. When you and I got saved and baptised and filled with the Spirit, we got everything Jesus had to offer us, didn't we? We got it at that very moment. There's nothing else left, is there? I mean, we can't crucify Jesus again. It's not necessary. He accomplished everything on the cross. How about the quality of these spiritual blessings? Well, Paul describes these things as blessings in heavenly places. This literally means that these blessings are things that originated in heaven. They're not earthly blessings, but they are heavenly blessings in the most literal sense. They are heavenly things. And with that in mind, it will help us all to learn just what these heavenly things are. We are told in verses 4 to 14, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. He speaks of foreknowledge. He knew about us before the foundation of the world, before anything any of that whole creation thing that we dealt with was, was even started. We were thought of. We were chosen. For some reason, God in his wisdom chose me before the world was formed. He knew me before he formed me in my mother's womb and he had already determined that I would be in his family. Now, I can't explain the election and ramifications of it today. That's a subject for a whole another day and I don't think it's even need to talk about it, to be honest. But I'm still going to rejoice in it. One of the greatest spiritual blessings we enjoy as saved people is the fact that we were chosen in Christ by the grace of God. I wonder what I've got there. Okay. Romans 8, 28 to 31. He loved me even though he knew all about me. Ephesians 1, 5. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the pleasure of his will. He speaks of us as family. We were adopted as sons and daughters. This verse tells us we're adopted into the family of God. That is, at the moment of salvation, you and I became the children of God. 1 John 3, 2 says, We are his sons and daughters with all the rights and privileges that come to any child born into the family. The Father brought me into his family and he made me his child. What a blessing is that? What a blessing. Ephesians 1 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made it accepted in the beloved. The beloved is referring to Jesus. We're accepted in Jesus. Okay? In verse 6, he speaks of favour. This verse reminds us that we're accepted by the Father. When we received Jesus, we were reconciled to the Lord. There was a time when we were outcasts and aliens. But now in Jesus we are approved by the Father. We've been brought near to him by the blood of Jesus. And this means that God is literally pleased with us. A lot of Christians waste a lot of time trying to do what Jesus did when he died on the cross. Please the Father. But the Father is pleased with me. Not because I'm trying to please him, but because I wear the righteousness of Christ. 
What a blessing is that? Right? Verse 7, the first part. In him we have redemption through his blood. This talks about our freedom. The verse tells us that we've been redeemed. There are three Greek words in the New Testament that are translated redeemed. And this one means to release a captive after the payment of a ransom price. It carries the idea of purchasing a slave and then immediately turning that slave loose. This is what Jesus did for us. He paid the price. And then he set us free. Amen? Amen. Jesus died for me, saved me by his grace and delivered me from the captivity of sin. What a blessing is that? Right? They're starting to add up, aren't they? In the second half of verse 7. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So our forgiveness is in direct proportion to his riches. Is there any limit to the riches of his grace? Is there any limit on that? So we're not likely to get there, are we? We're not likely to ever get to a point where we'll never be forgiven. Because it's in direct proportion to the riches of his grace. We have been forgiven for all our sins. What a blessing. Hey, what a blessing. Verses 11 to 14 speak of, speak of more spiritual blessings that manifest themselves as we go through life into the future. One eleven. In him also we have obtained an inheritance. That's interesting. We have an inheritance. Well, we're sons. We're daughters. We get an inheritance. Awesome. <laughs> this verse speaks of our heavenly home, our inheritance. Every child of God has a home awaiting them. Jesus himself said in John 14, In my Father's house are many mansions. If this were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This home is beyond compare, isn't it? This is going to be a crack. <laughs> it's going to be a beauty. 1 Peter 3.5. I'm, I'm putting all these scriptures up now because I think you need to receive them through your eyes and through your ears. And just get a handle on these things. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away. Reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith, for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And then the last one, Revelation 21, 1 to 3. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I can sense a house coming. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. We have an eternal home. That final eternal home is going to be that glorious new Jerusalem. It's going to be fabulous, isn't it? Absolutely unbelievable. What a blessing. Ephesians 1.12 That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. This is what's called a doxology. That's a church word, isn't it? A doxology. A doxology is a little hymn of praise that just gets slipped in 
and amongst all the text. Remember I told you all about the Greek grammar and stuff. They can tell this is a song and that Paul was probably singing it as he wrote it. <laughs> okay, just by the way it all goes together. That we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. We'll notice that Paul stops and he actually sings this doxology after he tells what each person of the Godhead has done. He has just finished telling us about the work of the Son and of the blessings to believers who follow him. Then he writes that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. God does not exist to satisfy the whim and wish of the believer. The believer exists for the glory of God. And when the believer is in the centre of the will of God, he is living a life of fullness and of satisfaction and of joy. Wow. How good is that? It tells of our consecration. This verse refers to the new way we're to live our lives after we come to know the Lord Jesus as our Saviour. The fact is that we're changed by salvation, aren't we? Scripture says if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The whole things have passed away. The whole, all things have become new. Isn't that right? We're changed. An experience that does not produce change, both inwardly and outwardly, is not a valid salvation experience. When he saves us, he begins the process of making us more like him. He gives us life and enables us to live a new life. What a blessing. What a blessing. So the passage began by telling us of the blessing that we received from God the Father. And then it moves on to tell us of the inheritance that we have because of the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And now we move on to the path that the Holy Spirit has in this process of heavenly blessings for us as believers who are in Christ. Verse 13. In whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So we have the promise of our preservation. These verses remind us that when we were saved, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Do you know what that sealed word means? No? Remember, it's the wax seal imprinted. No, we were sealed. This means that he is the down payment. He is the guarantee money, if you like. He is the deposit money that you put down when you put down your deposit on a house. Right? It's not refundable. Right? Right? You can't cash it in. He is the deposit that guarantees our eternity. The Holy Spirit is the Lord's promise that what he began at the moment of salvation, he will continue until we are home with him. Philippians 1.6. I always think of this verse when I think of that thought. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So he's not finished with us yet, is he? Jesus hasn't come back, so there's still work to be done. Amen? Amen. Some of us, there may be more work than others. I'm not so sure about that. But anyway, and then 2 Timothy 1.12. For I know whom I believe. Someone should write a song about this. For I know whom I believe and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. If you're saved, guess what? You are saved. You are sealed. If you are sealed, you're secure. Jesus said these words. And I, gave, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. And again, Peter affirms that we who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. If you are secure, then you can rest and rejoice in that truth. Thank God in Jesus we are saved to the uttermost, aren't we? 
I've got a verse for that too. Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. How many more blessings can there be in this one passage? It's just full of it, isn't it? The last two words of verse 3 tell us what a person must do to enjoy all of those spiritual blessings. If I go all the way back to verse 3, which I don't think I have here, no, it says, uh, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. So where do we have to be? In Christ. The one thing is to be in Christ. The only way for anyone to enjoy the spiritual blessings of the Lord is for that person to be saved by the grace of God. At the moment of conversion, you're placed into the body of Christ. You get in Christ. When this happens, you're made a partaker of all the spiritual blessings of the Lord. So here's the question. Are you in Christ today? Are you in Jesus today? And you might ask, how can I know, Peter? Good question. I've got an answer. 1 John 5, 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Amen. 1 John 5, 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Does that describe you? If so, then rejoice because you're blessed <laughs> with all these spiritual blessings that you didn't even know about. <laughs> right? You've got all these spiritual blessings. This is the riches of his glory, which is all yours. And if that doesn't describe you, then you can be saved by coming to Jesus in faith and by receiving him into your heart and your life. And then you too can begin to enjoy all the Lord has to offer. Amen? All right. When you and I look to our blessing from the Lord's perspective, I think we would all have to say that we're blessed. Would that be right? Okay. God has provided us with blessings that are beyond description, beyond measure as to their value. I think we just need to learn to praise the Lord for his blessings. We need to learn that we often, what we often think of as blessings really aren't. Too often the real blessing is in life are those spiritual things that we always have, no matter what else is happening around us. I mean, the real blessings of life are the things that never change and that never fade away. We are blessed. No matter what else is happening, if you're saved, you're blessed. Abundant. And I think we ought to thank him for those blessings. Amen? Amen. Amen.